We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online, and then we have in-person services on our campus at nine and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. In two weeks, we will find out which of the 32 football teams in the NFL is the greatest this season. In six weeks, we'll know which of the movies that are being considered uh, this year will win the Oscar for the best picture. Now, millions of us will watch these events because, well, we all love greatness. We all aspire to be great at something. We dream of standing out from the crowd and knowing that we have accomplished something rare and something good. And so watching the greatest compete or receive awards gives us at least a taste of greatness, even if we're watching it from our couch, not necessarily a great feat in and of itself. But in this scramble for greatness and the attempt to get ahead in life, it's very easy for us to lose sight of the really important things that uh, matter, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And Jesus identifies the pursuit that we're going to be looking at uh, uh, in this new series that he says is the greatest pursuit of all. Jesus says this, the greatest among you will be your servant. Now, there is no trophy given out for this pursuit. You will never see a competition for, the, for this kind of greatness ever televised. And when Jesus said this, if you read the context, uh, it was pretty surprising uh, statement that he made uh, to his disciples. His disciples were surprised by it. And honestly, it, it still, it sounds nice, but it's, if you really think about it, it's pretty confusing. I mean, what is so great about serving? Is it really worth it? And if so... How do we become great at it? If serving is the greatest, as Jesus said, then it really deserves our attention. So we're going to take four weeks and dive into this topic. Today we start where serving begins, and that is with the decision to be a servant. Now, most of us do some serving. We at least dabble in serving, and given the right opportunity, we will serve others. But Jesus isn't talking about serving as a hobby. He's talking about serving greatness, and there's only one path that leads to that kind of serving, and that's the decision to follow the greatest servant to ever walk this earth, Jesus Christ himself. Here's what Jesus says about serving in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus says to his disciples, just, just look around you. And he points to the Gentiles because the Gentiles, particularly the Rome, Roman Gentiles, were in the positions of authority. Uh, they were under Roman rule at this time. And he says, if you just look around at all of the people who are considered great in the world, they are lords. They're not servants. And it's pretty much the same today. So how can we learn to be great at serving when honestly it is so uncommon to pursue this? Well, the only way we become great is by following Jesus in the opposite direction. As the world around us is trying to figure out how to get to the next rung, we're trying to figure out how to lower ourselves. We're heading in the opposite direction. And we're following Jesus, who, as he said about himself, did not come to serve, or to be served rather, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, Jesus didn't serve on occasion. He embodied serving. Philippians 2 verse 7 says this, that when Jesus came to earth, he took on, it says, the very nature of a servant. What that means is he didn't just serve. He, from his birth to his death, he lived serving. 
And so when we decide to follow Jesus, we follow him in this endeavor. And following is, is not a, a one-and-done activity. Following is an ongoing activity. And it comes with daily decisions that change us over time. In the verses that precede this verse, in a fee, or Philippians 2, verse 7, we are given three ongoing decisions that I think form the essential practices of the kind of serving greatness that Jesus leads us toward. This afternoon, as some of us watch playoff football, we're going to see some great football players. And they're football players because, well, they decided to be football players. But the reason that they're great at it is because they have practiced football for years, thousands and thousands of hours. So it's, it's not enough for us to make a decision to follow Jesus and to be a servant. If we're going to be great at it, we have got to practice. And so I want to share with us as we get started this morning on this topic, the three practices that are involved in following Jesus Christ in this pursuit of serving. The first practice is looking up. Serving is hard, thankless work. And so to be great at it, we need help and resources that are beyond us. We need to look up and ask God for help. Without his help, we will never aspire to serving greatness. We do not have the natural ability to be great at serving. We, our hearts head in the opposite direction. So we need help from God. Philippians 2, verse 1, this is the chapter in which that verse 7 statement about Jesus being the, in the very nature of servant, this is how the chapter begins. Philippians 2, verse 1 says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, and then it goes on to verse 2, which we'll look at in just a moment. Now, this chapter is from a letter written by the Apostle Paul, early church planner in the first century, to the church in Philippi. And they are, as a church, they're under a tremendous amount of pressure at this time. Rome has decided that um, these new followers of Jesus Christ are a threat um, to the empire, and so they've outlawed following Jesus, and the Roman emperor at this time is Nero. And if you've read much about Nero, he was not a good guy. And Nero right now, when this letter is being written in history, he's on, on a rampage against Christians. In fact, he is the one who notoriously was known for dipping Christians alive in oil and lighting them and putting them on a post to light the Appian Way. So if you decide to follow Jesus Christ, you are under tremendous pressure at this time. So that's who the Apostle Paul is writing to. The Apostle Paul himself is writing this in prison in Rome. He's been arrested and he's awaiting his trial and most likely his death. So both the writer and the reader, Paul and the people in this church, are experiencing probably the darkest days, the toughest days of their lives. And so that's, if you know that context, it makes this statement seem kind of odd. So Paul asks them if they have any encouragement, any comfort, any fellowship, any tenderness, any compassion. Now, doesn't that sound like a bizarre question? Almost insensitive. Because if you look at their situation, it wasn't encouraging, it was discouraging. It wasn't full of comfort, it was full of pain. They're, they're, they were isolated. They weren't experiencing a lot of fellowship. Their life was nothing about tenderness. They didn't experience a lot of compassion, they experienced a lot of rejection. So obviously, these items are not coming from their circumstances. So why is Paul asking this? It's because when you decide to follow Christ, as they did, Paul points out the important key in this, in this verse, and that is that they are united with Christ. What that means is that they, and now us, if we decide to follow Jesus, we always have access to Jesus in all situations. 
And that's important because the resources of God that are above your circumstances and beyond your ability can help you do what you could never do on your own. And we need help. This is why we look up. So Paul is reminding them and encouraging them to look up, to look up at the one that they follow for help in the middle of this horrible set of circumstances. And when it comes to serving, if our serving is limited to our natural limits and our natural abilities and our natural preferences, we will never attain serving greatness. We will serve when it's convenient. We will serve when we are adequately recognized and appreciated. We will serve out of the overflow of our lives. The the leftover time will be given to serving. Only after our own needs are met. In other words, we probably won't serve that much. Definitely not to the level of greatness. So how much help from God do we need if we are going to follow Jesus on this path of serving? How much help do we need? I want you to notice how many times the word any is said in this. How much is any? Any. I mean, just any little bit qualifies for any, the smallest amount. So it may not seem like much to pause, humble yourself, look up at Jesus and ask for help rather than down at your circumstances. But all it takes is just a little bit of humility, a little bit of time to look up and get help from God. Now this looking up practice is a practice, which means it's probably not going to happen automatically. It requires practice. You have to build it into your daily life. And what's amazing about Jesus is he modeled this often. One of the early examples is found in Mark 1.35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The disciples got up and, where is he? And this happened on a regular occasion. Jesus was God in flesh, but while he was in the pressure cooker of this world, he needed to look up to his Father often for help. And so if Jesus needed to, we definitely need to. Jesus' greatest act of service was giving his life on the cross for us. And just before he did this, the pinnacle of all serving He asks three of his disciples to go with him to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray with him. Why? Well, they keep falling asleep as Jesus goes off to pray. And so on one occasion, Jesus explains why. And this is in Matthew 26, verse 41. He just says to them, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. We don't have the power in ourselves. That's definitely true of his disciples who could not even stay awake in this critical moment. But it turns out it was also true of Jesus in a human body. Because when Jesus went off to pray, we are told that he prayed so fervently and wrestled so strongly with what he was facing, knowing that death was coming, that he sweat drops of blood. That's a struggle. So it's not enough to intend to serve. We are too weak in our own power to follow through. If Jesus had the pattern of looking up before he served, we, how much more do we need to do that? Now, all of the great servants that I know personally, there is this pattern that is true of their life. They have developed the pattern of taking time each day to look up, and it helps them look up through their day then. And so if If you're wanting to get some help in this, we've got a class that's coming up on February 25th. It's about how to have a quiet time. Quiet time is just simply a a period of time set aside in your day to pray to God, to read something out of his word, and to ask for help. So if this is new to you, then in this class, we're going to give you some some tips, some tools on how to do this. If you need a, a reset or a refresh on this, I would encourage you to come. Uh, to this class as well. So it's it's going to be at the end of next month, February 25th. You can just sign up on your connection card for that. 
Now, for me personally, I have worked on this pattern for most of my adult life. But there's something that I've noticed is whenever my life gets hard, my tendency is to reduce time with God. That's my tendency. And the reason is pretty obvious because whenever life gets difficult or particularly busy, um, what I need is more time, not less time. There's more for me to do. There's more to think about. There's more to process. And when you take time, a quiet time, you're actually giving time to that. And so in the mornings, I find my mind already moving and trying to address the issues or the problems or whatever they are. And I find myself wanting to rush or maybe even skip this time. But what I've learned over the years is that while it seems to me that what I really need in the moment of pressure is more time, the truth is what I really need is more help. And if I trade help for time, that's a losing trade. Because God's help is able to turn the time that I have into something that I couldn't do on my own. And so I've learned, and I, I really work when things are, are tough, to not skimp, and if anything, to maybe lean into this time, because I need so much help. So that's practice number one, looking up. Practice number two is walking behind, walking behind. After they look up, servants of Jesus don't just start randomly serving. Here's what it goes on to say in Philippians 2. 2. So remember verse 1, Paul is saying, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, on and on. Then he goes on to say, then, in verse 2, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. So what is, he, what is he saying? Let's just get the definitions clear. To be like-minded means that you all agree on what to do. Not, not generally, but specifically. That's what it means to be like-minded. You agree. Having the same love in this context means that you all agree on what is most important. Your, your priorities, what you love, you're in agreement on that. Being one in spirit and purpose means that out of all of the possible agendas to pursue, you all agree on which ones you're going to pursue. So that's what Paul is saying. If you have any of these um, encouraging and comforting and good qualities by being united with Christ, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Now, notice there's been a shift that's taken place from verse 1 to verse 2 of Philippians chapter 2. And the shift is, verse 1 is addressed to us as individuals. Verse 2, it's shifted now from the individual to a group. And that's be it's obvious because being like-minded, well, you need at least two minds to be like-minded. If you're talking about yourself, that's another set of problems. But we're talking about being like-minded. And so agreeing on what's important and then being united about what to do about it, that's what groups do, not just individuals. So what group is Paul referring to? It's in the title of the book. The title of this book is Philippians, because he is writing to the church in Philippi to tell them to make his joy complete by agreeing on what they're supposed to do and agreeing on their priorities and being one in their agendas and their purpose. Now, if you think about it, how can this happen? Because no two minds are always like-minded. If you're married, you know this. You're not like-minded just automatically. No two people are always have the same priorities, love the same thing. No two people always agree on how to do things. So if you increase that number from 2 to 20 or 100, or in the case of this church, hundreds, you have just moved the highly unlikely to the totally impossible. There's no way a group this size is going to be like-minded. You're going to love the same things. You're going to have the same purpose. That's just impossible. So what is being asked of this church? What is Paul saying here? He's asking them to do 
the uncommon thing and get behind the leaders of the church and follow. Because if you decide to follow the greatest servant who ever lived, it does make sense. I think everyone would agree. It makes sense why you need to look up and ask him for resources to, to expand your serving beyond your natural interest and limits. But why do you need to pick a church and get behind its mission and its priorities and its agendas and do most of your serving there? What does that have to do with serving? It's because the local church is where serving meets following. Now, we would all prefer to serve God directly. And what I mean by that is God tells us individually when and where to serve, and we do it. Now, God does that occasionally, but in the Bible, it's more the exception than it is the rule. Instead of leading us just one-on-one, -on -one, in the New Testament portion of the Bible, God sets up churches, like in Philippi and like here. And he calls them the body of Christ, which, as we talked about a few weeks ago, means that if you want to follow Christ, you have to find a church and follow him there. It's where his body is. Now, why doesn't God just lead us directly? Well, it's because if you only follow God directly, directly, individually, it's very easy to pretend follow, to think you're following and you're not really following. You're think, you think maybe you're doing what God wants you to do, but it's very easy for you to start doing what you really want to do and just signing his name to the bottom of that. That's true for all of us. Think of it this way. Imagine if you worked at a, at a company where the boss uh, was never seen. You knew the name of the boss, but the boss never showed up. But everyone, let's just say there were 100 employees, every one of the 100 employees reported to the boss directly by phone to receive direction about what they should do in that company. If that was the case, what would happen over time? Would there be more or less unity among those 100 people about what to do on the job? There would be less unity. Why? Because it's very easy for us to only hear what we want to hear. This is really true of us. And this is what we tend to do with Jesus. It's easy for us to mishear what Jesus wants us to do or to project our own ideas and desires on him. And because Jesus never physically shows up to correct us, who's going to counter that? Who's going to get away with it? That's why Jesus leads us through his body on earth, the church. Because it's really the only real way we can stay on track. Otherwise, we are just prone to get on, getting off track and thinking we're on track. So the question that we all need to ask is, where are we serving? Where are we walking behind? What church? What are we doing? Who are you following at that church? You see, the real test of following is when you disagree with the leader that you're following. If you agree with the leader, it's not hard to follow. It's only when you disagree with the leader and you still decide to follow that you prove that you are really walking behind, not just walking next to someone. So if we aspire to serving greatness... We learn how to serve, and we practically serve as we walk behind someone in some church somewhere on some team. That's where serving greatness is learned. That's one of the practices. Now, we live, this is a very unusual idea for many Christians in our culture because we live in a time of, uh, I don't know how to say it, other than Christian celebrities, there's a lot of people who are followers of Christ who are famous. There are many amazing Christian speakers. There's all kinds of amazing worship leaders, Christian worship leaders. And thousands gathered to hear them and buy their books and download their music. And that's good. We can learn a lot from these Christian celebrities. But there's one thing we cannot do with Christian celebrities— we cannot follow them because we don't know them. 
and they don't know us. So we can't actually really, they can, we can be influenced by them, but we can't practically follow them. We can't learn serving and pursue this greatness behind them. We have to be in a place where we know those who are leading and we and they know us. So if this is the local church that God has placed you in, then as Paul said, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Now, this is a, not about warm feelings of serving and warm thoughts. This is about doing real work. So I would encourage you over this series, as you think about before God, what steps you need to take to move towards greatness in serving, uh, you might want to check the box on the connection card there every week that just says, you know, I want to volunteer on a team. And we'll get in touch with you and begin to help you figure out where, where that is. Even if you're already serving and you'd like to do something different, have a conversation, check that box, and we'll get in touch with you. So that's the second practice, walking behind. So looking up, walking behind, practice number three, letting go. Serving comes with a price. It often costs us something that we want. This is why it's so hard to be great at it. Philippians 2, the rest of these verses, verses 3 through 8, this is what it says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. We looked at this verse actually last week, but we're going to look in the larger context. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also those of uh, also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being, here it is, in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So to take on the very nature of a servant Jesus had to let go of something. What he had to let go of was his divine nature, particularly the status that comes with being divine. He had to let go of the status of the fact that he was God, equality with God. Now, to us, status is a very dynamic, fluid thing. It's something that we earn, and it's something that we can lose pretty quickly because people and what they think of us is very unstable, and even our own abilities are very unstable. But God's status is not like our status. God's status comes not from what people think of him, but from who he is. So to serve us and save us from sin, God had to take on a body. Talk about letting go. He went from creator to being born. He went from absolute power to experience human weakness. And this was not a, a one-time act of humility. It's not a one-time decision. He walked this earth in a body. Now again, God, equality with God in a body for 33 years. At any time, he could have said that, you know, that's enough, and ended that. But he didn't, because he did not, as it says, consider equality with God something to be grasped, be held on to. He let it go. He freely let it go so that his sinless life could pay the debt of our sinful lives. And I think the most amazing example of it was on the cross. I mean, on the cross, he endured the ridicule of those that he had created, I mean, the lungs that filled with air that was pushed over the vocal cords to mock at him was lungs he had created. The saliva that was formed and hurled at him was, was saliva that he had created. He let go of the honor he rightfully deserved. Now he invites us to let go of what we think we deserve. Now, what we have to let go of to take on the nature of a servant is, of course, nothing like what Jesus had to let go of. 
but it still, still feels unnatural to us. It almost feels like we're giving up our nature to, to let go of some of these things that we need to do to serve. And the reason is because there are two things that are identified in these verses that, that are kind of baseline for us. They, they tend to feel natural to us. And those two things are these two phrases, selfish ambition and vain conceit. Now, when you read them out loud, we would automatically, if it was on a test, we would say, yeah, those aren't good. But it's what just naturally rises in our hearts. To be selfish is to be focused on what you want. That's natural to us now. Selfishness combined with ambition elevates selfishness to a drive. Now, most people, if you talk to them, will agree, it's not good to be selfish. So because of the wide agreement that it's not good to be selfish, does that make selfishness rare? No. Not, not in my home, not in your home. Why not? It's because of the second thing that it's paired with, vain conceit. Vain conceit fuels and, and justifies and puts energy behind selfish ambition. What vain conceit does, selfish ambition says, here's what I want. Vain conceit says, Here's why I deserve it. To be vain, proud, is to raise yourself up. To be conceited is to look down on others. So it's talking about the two directions we look as we, we raise ourselves up so we can look down on other people. The higher that we are in our minds, the more that we think we deserve. Vain conceit convinces us that what we want is more important than what someone else wants. Now, the reasons... I've noticed for me personally, usually are words that end in two letters, E-R. The two letters E-R. In other words, I deserve more because I'm smarter, or I work harder, or I'm better. Now, I wouldn't say this, but I kind of feel this sometimes. So this is why, over the years, I've noticed a pattern in my own life is that I get home after a long and hard day of work, and I feel justified to be selfish because I have worked, what? Harder. Now, if you were to actually look at it, not necessarily true. But that's just the way it works. We, we come to think of what we deserve, we look down, and we expect to be served rather than to serve. But servants let go of their status. For Jesus, it was his true status that he had to let go of, the nature of a servant. For us, it's usually just a false sense of status that we have to let go of. But that doesn't mean it's easy for us to let go of it. So a helpful thing to do if you want to pursue greatness in serving is to try to make a short list of what do you regularly think that you deserve? I mean, do you deserve a promotion? Do you, des do you think you deserve happiness? That's one for me. Do you think you deserve recognition? Do you deserve a raise? Do you deserve a break? What is it? And how is that preventing you or limiting your service? Now, for me, I can't think or feel my way into letting go of selfish ambition and vain conceit. In my heart, and I would suspect in your heart, they grow like weeds. They just keep rising in my own heart. We have to act our way into letting go. So this week, pick a person that you want to serve and try to pick one interest of theirs that you can help with and then help with it. Serve. And here's the key thing. Don't say anything. Don't even stand there with the, well, look on your face. Just serve. The first word in each of these three practices ends in the same three letters, I-N-G. It's not look up, it's looking up. It's not walk behind once, it's walking behind. It's not, okay, I'll let go of that, and I'll take it back, it's letting go. Serving starts with a decision to follow Jesus, but it continues as an ongoing practice. Now this afternoon, I, um, I plan to watch some football. A couple of games that I, I look forward to watching. And it's going to be fun, um, partly because none of my teams are in there anymore, so I'm not that emotionally attached. It's just going to be good football. 
So greatness will be on display this afternoon. But I, I want to remind myself, and I encourage you, to, if you can, as you're sitting on your couch, remind yourself, this isn't real greatness. This is football. Okay, this isn't real greatness. It's amazing, but it's not real greatness. This is football. What Jesus said is this, the greatest among you will be your servant. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you as our Savior and our Lord, the one we follow. And we are so grateful for your forgiveness. So grateful that you laid your life down, that we could find life ourselves that we don't deserve. And as we consider these matters of greatness that you've said in serving, I pray that you would teach us, you would show our own hearts. You would give us something very specific for us to begin practicing and working on. Because we know that when we stand before you face to face, um, all of the awards and all of the ratings of this world will, will not matter. And everything will be resized and reordered according to what you say is great. So we thank you for your word that tells us what is great. And I pray that you'd help us this week to let go of what we think we deserve, to get behind, to look up and ask for help, and then just to serve. May we become greater than we are in this. And we ask this now in the name of Jesus. Amen.